webinar series. Uh, I am Marcella Leonard and I'm going to be hosting the webinar today. Before we begin the session, there's a few quick housekeeping points that we need to go through. Uh, for participants listening in French, click on floor at the bottom left of the screen and select French. To see and follow along with the PowerPoint presentation in English, click presentation on the top left of the screen. To follow along with the presentation in French, download the French version of the presentation by clicking on documents on the right. Feel free to download the presentation in both English and French by clicking on documents on the right. There will be a Q&A during the last five minutes of the webinar. To submit your question, please go to the toolbar on the right, click on messaging and then participants and type in your question. You can submit your questions at any time. If you're watching this webinar in a group, please enter the number of participants in the group by clicking on messaging and then participants. We will now begin our discussion. As I said, I am Marcella Leonard, and uh, as you can hear from the accent, I'm from over from Ireland, and I'm absolutely delighted um, to be joining you um, with Boost CYAC to do this um, webinar with you today. I'm not going to spend any time explaining my background. I'm an independent social worker. I'm specialising in, in sex and violent risk because you have a bio that you can read about me or you can go onto my website at Leonard Consultancy and read more about me if you if you need to. So what we're going to do is go straight into the, the, the um, webinar is really going to take a look at um, how it's important to assess the risk posed by sex offenders. And I suppose in some way it's about trying to challenge that perception of when we hear the words low, medium and high being assigned to a person who's committed a sexual offence. And that also includes adolescents. So although a lot of the conversation I'm talking about will be maybe towards adults, this is also relevant for those people who are under the age of 18 who have also committed um, harmful sexual behaviour. There isn't any such thing as a typical sex offender because they can be male or female, they can be young or old. And I think what's really important is that more increasingly, um, and certainly throughout some of the other countries that I'm working in and my day-to-day -day practice, I'm getting more and more teenagers under 12s who are presenting with um, harmful sexual behaviour. Now, some of them may have been uh, a victim prior to committing their harmful sexual behaviour on, an, on another person, but some of them may not have been. Certainly the increase of technology has, has caused a lot more increase in terms of young people who are engaging in abusive sexualized behavior, language through the sharing of imagery of themselves, imagery of friends. Um, and I think that for me has been one of the most significant increases in my work over the last couple of years. Also, people who have committed sex offences, you know, they have different levels of education, social skills, the ability to relate to others. And that's a really significant point in terms of understanding why somebody has done this. Because the key to assessing is, is assessment is not something that you should ever do to somebody. Uh, when I'm training people around undertaking assessments, assessment is, is a very much a dynamic process. Um, I have not done my job properly as far as I'm concerned if a sex offender and or their partner ever leaves a session with me and not having learned something about themselves, they know why they have done this. Um, their partner may not know why they've done it, but they know why they've done it. They, they have an insight as to why they're doing it. Certainly for those people who've been doing it for a long period of time, like for example, over several years, they may forget the original reason why they started, but they will certainly know why they continued it. So one of the things we need to bear in mind is about what has been their level of education, their social skills, their ability to relate to others. What's the connection with that in terms of understanding why they have done this? If we're going to try and prevent further harm and try to prevent the establishment of more victims, we have to understand with people why they've done this in the first place and, and tackle that. Assessment, don't forget, is not about what you've done. It's about assessing what's the likelihood of you going to do it again. And sometimes that can be the core bit to blocking people in terms of understanding the assessment of risk. So some of them can be married, some of them can be single. Uh, they can commit contact or non-contact offences, which is sometimes are known as internet offences. I think it's very difficult uh, to sort of call it to me non-contact because I think, and I, although I have it down in the PowerPoint as non-contact, you'll, you'll find me referring it a lot more now to in the room, the difference between an in the room um, sexual behaviour and those who 
aren't in the room, but as far as I'm concerned in terms of the harm that they cause. So I think there's even needing to be a bit of a challenge now around the myths around contact and non-contact. But they also come from a range of employment and professional background. We, we know that, um, that there's no particular background we're saying we haven't come across. Some of them will have strong ties to families and communities. Some will have weak ties to the communities. Some of them will have prior criminal record um, and some of them will have none. And I think for me, one of the biggest challenges, particularly I think again as professionals, is that how we already make a judgment about somebody because maybe they've already been known to statutory services like police, criminal justice, um, and therefore we make an assumption that their risk is greater because of the fact they've already been known to us. And the professional person who presents with no previous history, no previous criminal history, no previous you know, social care history, no previous social work history, we think, well, maybe this is something that's happened and it's, it's not going to be as serious because they're not as criminal. And I find that can be a real challenge to us because that person is, for me, probably somebody who's much more clever and much more, and if we can sort of use the term, he's a much more effective sex offender. He's, he's a sort of a much more sort of in, inverted commas qualified sex offender because he's been able to probably commit sex of, sexual abuse for a longer period of time, but yet have the persona of normality. And one of the things, I suppose, the two, the two words I would say to you as we're sort of talking through about assessment, you're really assessing how they've had the confidence to be able to continue to sexually abuse and sexually harm, but also what has been the competency that they have developed while they've done it. So think of those two words of confidence and competency. For somebody to have been able to commit a sexual abuse against an individual for a period of time, you've had to get good at it because that victim hasn't told, that victim hasn't has been has has not been able to come forward. And why have they not? And actually that's because I'm a confident sex offender. I'm somebody who is is knows how to do this. I know how to work the system that I'm living in or working in if that's where the abuse is taking place. But I'm also competent in what I'm doing as well, in that I've been able to obviously get my sexual needs met through the victim. Uh, without that victim telling. So think of those two words in terms of what's the confidence and competency that a, a sex offender, a particular sex offender has developed. But also some of them may or may not have been known to social and mental health services. So again, it's about really, I suppose the start is about looking at the range of personalities and presentations that, that you know each sex offender in their own right presents. But before we sort of move into that, I think it's about sort of remembering this, is that the difference from what happened in the room and i think the key to me in terms of understanding the assessment of sex offenders is we need to go back to what actually happened because what happened in the room gets significantly reduced by what the victim has been able to tell us how a victim tells us what happened will be hugely impacted by what we ask and if i ask questions that implies to the victim anything to do with blame or questions, I can send them on a different trajectory that maybe then they leave out things that are actually really critically important. But also if I'm only focusing on, on what did they do to you? In other words, behaviors. One of the critical things for assessment of sex offenders, as I've said, is not what they've done because not everybody, not every sex offender gets to do everything they want to do to the victim. So that's keep that in mind. What happens is when we're questioning, we often focus very quickly on, on what did they do? Because we're thinking potentially from a policing perspective, we're thinking of what was the crime that was committed. So therefore, what I'm able to tell you will be very hugely impacted on what you're asking me. And I'm going to talk about very clearly about, for example, Victims will describe to us about the room it happened in, maybe the clothing they had to wear, maybe what they had to eat beforehand, maybe what game they were playing beforehand. And my concern sometimes is all of that background context is seen as sort of just background as we lead them up to tell us about what really happened. And one of the things I suppose I'm going to talk to you um, throughout this is the critical bit of going back to that background context, because actually that background context tells me actually why he's going to do this again or she's going to do it again because that gives me the whole sense of, of establishing the environment under which they 
um, that has allowed them to develop the competency to, to offend. So bear in mind, what I was able to tell you is actually less than what happened in the room. But then what you heard me say, because we then have the professional listening ear on, and as a child or an adult of a victim of sexual crime is telling us what has happened, we are going into a profession, ah, oh, that's that. Uh, oh, that's this. That meets the criteria of that. Oh, I know what you means by that. I know what he's trying to say. So we are, we are influencing what you heard me say, which is less than what I was actually able to tell you because of what how, how maybe distressed I was. But that's also less than what happened in the room. But then what will happen is that you, you know, criminal justice systems and, and our, our, our whole judicial system will have a determination of what was the offence. So when from the description of what you've heard me say, there will be a determination of what was the offence that has been committed, which is significantly less than actually what happened in the room. But then also there will become the plea bargaining of what was they were actually charged with. Because I may have been sexually abused three times a week for three years. That person will never get convicted for every count of the time that they touched me. But I can also tell you they will never get convicted if we go back to what happened in the room. If as a wee three-year-old, I was made to wear a thong and before I was actually I had to do something to my daddy, I also had to do a strip tease for him. And part of doing the strip tease was I had to wear underwear. The, the question should be asked, well, how come do you have a thong that would fit a three year old? There's where I'm telling you the background information tells me where would you have accessed that? Where would you have got that? But the wee child might just talk to me about that you had to wear pants that maybe stuck in her bum and they're a bit uncomfortable. But actually, I will never, as a sex offender, get convicted for making a child wear a thong. But what it does tell me about is how come you had to do that? It tells me more about his his confidence in doing that. Where did you access? What website were you on to find children's sexualized clothing? So what they are charged with is significantly less than what happened in the room. But also then what he pleaded to, because there will be the plea bargaining, and what he agrees then eventually to, to agree to, and that whole debate that goes on, will significantly be less than what happened in the room. And eventually then what he was convicted of. And I suppose what I'm wanting you to think about is how often we actually start assessments of sex offenders at the top of this triangle. We talk about John Brown received and uh, was convicted for four counts of in, indecent assault or three counts of gross indecency or two counts of rape or five counts of rape. And we, we end up then in our conversations as professionals, narrowing it down to the top of that pyramid. And actually that's not what happened in the room. Equally, that is not why he poses a risk of doing it again. It's not about the offense of which he did. It is not about the number of times that he did it. It's actually go back to what happened in the room. Why did you need to firstly have your sexual needs met by a three-year-old child? But also, why was that not enough? Why, why did you need to buy and search for sexualized clothing for a three-year-old? Why did you need the child to perform a strip tease for you? Why did you need to do that? That's why you may do this again, because actually that is what part of the excitement is about. What eventually I got that child to do to me is actually the top of the pyramid, but it is not why I will do it again. So that's really what I need to do is sort of come back and invert that triangle, invert it as you're listening to it and just see the distance between what somebody's convicted for and what happened in the room. Assessment of risk is back at the very bottom of the pyramid. It doesn't start off at the top of the pyramid. Hopefully that's make, making some sense. Because risk assessment is basically about a systematic collection of information and to the degree of the harm that somebody is, go, is going to do. And the issue here is around risk prediction in terms of the, the probability that that person is maybe going to do a specific um, act again. And then that leads to risk management. And I suppose for me, the concerning bit is, is that often risk management um, systems and structures tend to dictate, oh, that's the risk this person presents. And this is where we start to get this gen generalized language of, well, he's a high risk, so we need to manage him like this, or he's a low risk. But if we go back to that pyramid, 
that's all based on what eventually came out at the top of that pyramid. And actually, that's not really why that person did it in the first place. It's not telling you why they enjoyed it, because we need to be very clear here. My background is very much based around sexuality. And this is not about, therefore, just about the power and control that a sex offender might have over a victim. But it's getting to the sexuality of the offending, the core reason as to why would you enjoy having your sexual needs met by somebody who clearly was not enjoying that back. So what's that about? Why do you need to do that? So what we need to look at is that decision chain in terms of what were the antecedents, the reasons behind it, and therefore also about the consequences. After our risk assessments, um, so for example, in, in, in Canada, you might use static 99, which would be a familiar one that you would use uh, from, from assessing risk. Um, in the UK, we would use Risk Matrix um, 2000. That would be one of the tools we would use. Um, and those really are, so they identify what a general band of risk an offender falls into. It's a, it's a bit like an insurance where, um, for example, um, you know, a 52-year-old female uh, like myself, um, from a car insurance point of view, would probably be deemed to be a lower risk of having an accident than a 21-year-old male young person who's just driving for the first time likelihood is unfortunately they're probably at a higher likelihood because of the rage of having a car accident that's what actuarial risk assessments do so those tools that just basically say if we compare this sex offender to those who committed the same offense within that general population of sex offenders who have committed child sexual offenses or have committed adult rape the likelihood is if we compare this person within that group, likelihood is they are of low, medium or high. Now that's useful, but actually it doesn't tell us why he did it. He doesn't tell us that they're going to do it again. It's actually going to tell us that that's the band, that's your baseline as to what they're going to do. So that's why we move on to the next one, which is the dynamic bit, which is the why. What what is what is it telling us about the individual as to why they may have done that? What's what sort of has driven that person to do that? Why why has that person at this stage in their life decided to use somebody else to have their sexual needs met, but that that person actually was the wrong person to do it with? Why have they not chosen an age appropriate, a consensual mutual mutual experience in sexual experience, as opposed to something being abusive? There's also significant blocks that we have as professionals in terms of assessment. There is the unknown when we don't know what we don't know. Um, and that's a, that's a, if anything, as a risk assessor, that's the thing that sort of challenges is, is the things I don't know. But there's also the known but not fully appreciated. If I take, for example, a case where I had a, of, a, of a man where we go back to the three year old child who ended up doing a, a strip tease for her dad. This is this is a real case. Prior to him actually taking her up to the bedroom to engage in the, as I would see it, as the behavioural sexual offence, he carried out the emotional sexual abuse in the kitchen. Because what he would have done is every time he would have seen her, this was a dad, parents were separated, the child would have gone to him every Friday night to stay overnight for contact with him. They had no previous convictions. What he did was he had the food ready for her. Uh, wait for her to come, her, her treat, it was her choice in terms of the food. He knew she liked fish fingers and, and chips. But also part of the treat as well was that he would have cut her hair. So he would have cut her hair and she enjoyed daddy cutting her hair. That's what daddy did. When she got her two treats, then she had to go upstairs and she had to give daddy his treat, which was obviously that she had to perform, put on the underwear, perform a strip tease for him and then engage in a sexual activity. So that's what the victim had to do. This man then started to engage in another relationship, another another woman, whenever I, for the assessment. And when I was taking the, the information from his partner, his new partner, she had two children and she started to talk to me about how wonderful he was with, with her children and that he would spend hours brushing their hair. He would spend hours combing their hair, brushing their hair. So that information was known, but it was put to the side because the, first, the man will have never been convicted for the brushing of hair or cutting hair. But actually, that was a precursor to him getting used because he became sexually aroused by the smell of children's hair. Because he was somebody who presented with tryptophilia, which is one of the paraphilias. And part of his sexual arousal was the smell of children's hair. 
So there's where I'm saying to you, it's about the information we that is known, but we don't appreciate it. it's linked to risk, which is why everybody needs to listen to what happened in the room as opposed to what somebody got convicted for, for identifying those triggers. There's also then about the interpretation. So for example, that new partner interpreted that the behavior was, he's very committed, he's lovely to her children, he takes time with them. You know, as a man, he's bothered to put their hair in ponytails and he's prepared to, you know, brush their hair. I understand that interpretation, but what she didn't understand was actually that was a precursor to how it made him feel. But there's also then the objective and the subjective information that we bring into cases and, and that we make a, an, an attitude and we and actually lots of the times we tend to be more subjective and we make an assumption and the more subjective we are, actually the less objective, which means therefore our questioning becomes very limited and very restrictive, whereas we need to be very objective. We need to keep it wide, keep the questioning wide to understand why somebody has done this. We also don't look at the unappreciated data. So in other words, information that all, all other relevant agencies have gathered on an individual. For example, I had a man who was caught for speeding and I soon found out that he was that eventually by accident that he was caught for speeding. What turned out was on the days that he was caught for speeding paralleled with the days that the victim had sent when they had been sexually abused. The reason why he was caught from speeding was because he was sexually abusing adult females whom he would have caught in terms of from prostitution. And what he did was he did that during the day whenever he was working. So he had a very short passage of time in order to commit the abuse that he wanted to do. And that left him then that he tended to be speeding back to his workplace. Really important data that actually linked back to his modus operandi of how he worked but told you about the confidence and competency of him being able to do this in between his work. The decoy of dual pathology is where we actually are diverted off in terms of, because for example, we might have a child with um, attention deficit disorder or a child with some behavioral problems, and we get diverted by that and sort of focused on that as the professionals. And we're not looking at the reason why, because we might be too quick to diagnose that there's something wrong with the child. And we need to think about how that's been exploited by the offender. But sometimes as well as that, we have certainty which can cause us a block. If I'm certain about something, again, it affects my questioning. The questions need to be open, keep them open in order for you to make sure that you keep it objective. The competing task of the same visiting schedule, I think is really important, particularly with families where there's a lot of involvement from a lot of different disciplines and a lot of professionals, where we're asking them to go to lots of different appointments and in between all of that, they actually slip between the nets and we don't pick up the same information. The known and not assembled is again where we've got a load of information and we have actually lost that information because nobody's actually joining up the dots. The victims think we're joining up the dots. They think the victims believe we're joining up the dots. The victims are telling us stuff that they think, well, I've told Marcella this bit and I've told John over who works over here that bit and I've told the police this bit and I've told but actually we're not assembling them and we need to be very clear are we assembling it and go back to in the room what happened in the room to try to build that picture but also as professionals we have a bias of it not fitting with our current mode of understanding as well as the long-standing blocks and in other words what i mean by that is that we 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 believe we have maybe and we we believe we understand about how certain offenders work we believe well all offenders do this so therefore he doesn't do that therefore he's not the same risk we maybe, for example, have a perception, well, he's an adult rapist, therefore he doesn't pose a risk to a baby. We equally might have, well, he's somebody who has downloaded and viewed indecent images of children, but what we know is maybe he's not going to go on and commit a contact offence. So what we're trying to look at is what is what are the current modes of our beliefs and knowledge that are actually affecting us in terms of doing effective assessment. Assessing sex offenders is really about this, okay? It's really about trying to figure out what is normal, what is illegal and what is deviant. Not all sex offenders are deviant and that's a really, really critical thing to know about. And the reason why I'm saying that is what you're looking for is deviancy is, is how far from the norm has a person moved. If, for example, if we talk and I look later, but just you know, very quickly at different types of sex offenders. And what I'm going to do is, is sort of do, well, what is normal, what is deviant and what is illegal? 
most and all sex offenders have probably committed something that is illegal, but it may be, be illegal where they have committed the act. So for example, maybe they have been caught doing a sexual act, but with an age appropriate peer who was consenting, but where they did it was actually illegal. So they may have done it outdoors or they may have been viewed by somebody else, but they didn't know they're being viewed. So sometimes actually it was a normal activity. They just shouldn't have been doing it where they were doing it. And therefore it is illegal. But for example, if they were engaging in age appropriate consensual vaginal type of sexual intercourse, but they were doing it outdoors or they were doing it at a public beach. The, the illegal bit is the, is the public beach. Does that, and hopefully that makes sense. But not necessarily am I describing that person as a deviant individual. But the person who becomes sexually aroused to the prepubescent body form is clearly far from the norm. And that person will come into that band of deviancy. Equally so does the person who's age appropriate in their in their selection of the victim. So for example, adult to adult, but who engages in an act that goes against the norm of normal sexual excitement, normal sexual arousal. So for example, the person who gets aroused to the victim being upset, the, vect the person who gets aroused to the victim, you know, showing that upset, who's screaming, who's clearly very sore by the activity is taking place. And the more upset the victim gets, the more aroused the perpetrator gets. Clearly, then we've moved into the into the realms of deviancy, because arousal to a negative emotion is actually into the realm of sexual deviancy. So, really, what we're trying to find out is, was it normal by their choice of who they chose to be their victim? So, for example, age appropriate. Well, that that bit is normal. You know that that person hasn't moved from the norm. Is it illegal? Yes. They should all fit within the norm of legal, illegal because obviously they've been convicted for something. But not all of them necessarily will be deviant. And that's a real challenge, particularly when we're working with adolescents um, who have committed harmful sexual behaviour. So one of the assessment tools we will use for that is the AIM-2, um, currently being updated by myself to become an AIM-3 assessment tool. And the key to that bit is particularly for adolescents, because usually they are peer to peer sexual offending. And what we're looking for them is how far from the norm have they moved into that deviancy or actually they haven't really moved into the deviancy, but they've certainly done something illegal, but they're not as far down to that deviancy bit for us to not warrant putting interventions in there to bring them back into the norm. So get those three thoughts into your head. Is it normal? Is it, but it's illegal and it's also deviant or is it deviant? And it definitely is not anywhere near the norm and therefore obviously it's illegal or is it that it was normal and this person needs some education so for example maybe two peer age you know 14 15 year olds engaging in a sexual activity but we might decide it's illegal because of their age but actually both of them are saying they consensually agreed and engaged in the in their sexual activity so we're talking to them about illegal, about legality, about consent, about making sure it is about mutual. But maybe none of the acts of the actual activities that they did may have been deviant. So it's about making sure we break it, break it down. Because what we need to do is this here, is that we tend to start off from a general attitude of that the sex offender poses a risk to everyone all of the time. And actually, that's not the case. They don't sexually offend every minute of every day of every week of every month of every year so there's obviously times that they don't so they don't pose a risk to everyone all of the time what my job is in terms of doing risk assessments is get to the bottom bit which is who do you pose a risk to and under what circumstances so what are the circumstances that's going to increase that risk but also what are the circumstances that i know if i can identify those that might actually reduce your risk so i take a look at these things so I funnel it and I, and I use that term of funneling. I funnel down from that wide band of you pose a risk to everyone all of the time. And what I have to try to do is to assist child protection and to, to assist the work with victims is get it narrow it down into this is who you pose a risk to. And these are the circumstances under which I believe you're going to do that again, as well as but here are also the circumstances under which I believe that you won't do it again, because here's why I believe why you did it in the first place. So we look at their early years. 
you look at their family background, you look at so in the early years, we're looking at their attachments, you're looking at did they have a sense of being loved and cared for, were they brought up within a family that had, a, had, had good boundaries, where they had a sense of right and wrong, where sexuality was treated appropriately, and, and when I mean appropriately within very much their their beliefs in terms of culture, in terms of religion, in terms of their gender, and that they were brought up appropriately within that, but also understood the privacy of their own self and their own need for privacy. We look at their criminal history. We look at, are they somebody who normally breaks the law? Are they somebody who will always push the boundaries? Are they somebody that, in an actual fact, committing a sexual offence is the same for them as burglary, is the same as knife crime, as the same as any other. It's just part of their criminality. And by the very nature of that, we're dealing with a criminal person. Is alcohol and drugs involved in, in their sexual offending? So, for example, alcohol and drugs are disinhibitors. You know that as well. So, for example, when you have a you're out um, and you have a little drink, we become a lot more sort of relaxed. We, you know, we can sort of have a lot, have a lot more chat and banter with people and we can be more, more flirt flirtatious. We know that. So we know that alcohol and drugs are disinhibitors and they're disinhibitors for us sexually. Now, sometimes that can work for people, obviously, in consenting proper adult relationships that, that that's that's OK. But the reality is as well is that sexual offenders will also use that as a reason to disinhibit themselves and to block out the reasons why they shouldn't be sexually touching this child. But they'll use the alcohol to disinhibit those thoughts. So we're looking at is there a role of alcohol and drugs? But we also look at their psychosexual history, and that is one of the, the, the most extensive things we do in terms of taking um, an assessment is, and the psychosexual history is really going, and this is the same with adolescents and under 12s, whenever I'm doing an assessment of the wee ones, um, as well as the, on the adolescents and the adults. And this is really asking them, you know, where did you learn, learn about sex? Who taught you? What were the things that you learned? What were the influences? You know, and that's including what, what you know, the people, um, the the media, um, the you know from television, from DVDs, from the internet, from school, but also from your peers, from your family, and really you're trying to get a sense of what is sexuality to this person. You're looking at, for example, you know their first experience of, of you know for a meal. You're looking at their first experience around, for example, erections. What that felt for them. What was their understanding of it? You know, did they grow up in a family where there was a sense of maybe shame with that in terms of, you know, maybe culturally, religiously, how they felt about it? Equally, did they grow up in a family where actually it was talked about all the time but to the other extreme in terms of too much exposure to sexuality and actually no boundaries? You look at, for example, every relationship that they've had, what those relationships meant to them, what was the type of sexuality that engaged in those relationships. And really you're trying to understand, so what is it sexually drives this person? What what is what is what did the victim meet for them that they weren't able to meet in, in their previous psychosexual history? So that's that's what we're looking for. So what is it that is is it the fact that they were they were interested, for example, in a certain sexual act that they felt they couldn't do within a age consenting relationship? Or was it a, attraction to, to the excitement of doing it with a stranger? Were they excited by the fact of trying to do it to a prepubescent child? So you're sort of looking at what is the sexuality of the offending behaviour, as opposed to, I think, what tends to overemphasise things is around power and control. Let's just be very clear, For in order for me to do anything to any person who doesn't want it done to them, of course I'm going to have power and control. But actually, that's not why I do it. I don't do it for about power and control. These are sex crimes, and we need to be very clear of what is the sexuality dri drive within all of this, and that's where we focus on. But then we also, to funnel it down further, we look at the victim account and the sex abusive behaviour. We try to funnel it down to try to determine who do you pose a risk to, which gender, which age, is it? Is it both? Is it the fact that you, it doesn't matter whether it's prepubescent, adolescent or adult? Is that what you're attracted to? So we, we, we need to funnel it down and that's what we're trying to do in the assessment. And what I would, you know, for those of you who are engaging in taking assessments of risk, each one of these factors and sections is that you need to do an analysis on what does that mean for the very bottom of that funnel? So what does that tell me about why you pose a risk? 
who do you pose a risk to and what are those circumstances? But also listen to about how we communicate risk. Because sometimes if, I mean, I've put up a few examples here of how quickly we, we get into the manage, we talk about, well, there's a significant chance or there's a strong likelihood or there is a risk or it's high or he's a low risk. Can I maybe just say to be really careful of how we translate that? Because what tends to happen as professionals, if we don't do the previous funnel on and really do an in-depth assessment, what tends to happen is we as we write somebody's risk for who we're writing that report for. So in other words, if I'm if I'm going to a child protection case conference and I strongly do not want this person to have access to that child, I will probably use very strong language like significant, high risk, I will strong likelihood. But what's my evidence for that? Is that just because I'm going back to the fact that he's somebody who has committed a sexual offence? What is your evidence to say that he's a high risk? What, have you really funneled it down? So it's just about being careful about how we communicate it. If we take a look at in terms of, you know, the different types of sex offenders. Now, obviously, each one of these are somebody that you could talk about for sadly for days on end. And um, so I haven't got a lot of time to go in for it, but I'm going to just very, very quickly in terms of who presents the greatest risk and what are the key things in a, in a risk assessment that we need to be looking out for. What I firstly want to do is be very, very clear in terms of going back to the difference between the child sex offender and the paedophile. The paedophile is somebody who's attracted to and only to somebody with the prepubescent body form. So therefore, somebody who is in an age appropriate adult relationship, irrespective of that gender, so it's, it's irrelevant to me if it's the same gender uh, relationship or a heterosexual relationship, that's not the point. But the point being is they're attracted to the secondary sex characteristics. For that person to then sexually abuse somebody who is five, that's not a paedophile. They would not meet that criteria of paedophilia, particularly when we're very clear that in that adult age appropriate sexual relationship, they have engaged in and have been aroused to and have engaged in appropriate sexual contact in terms of sexual intercourse and penetrative activity and all of that. The only way that you would probably be able to determine whether a paedophile um, would be, you'd have to I suppose, be very clear, have they got pedoerotic fantasy? So in other words, do they think of children in order to be able to engage in the sexual activity with the adult person? And that's very specific training that we need to be able to do that. So where we have is that person who's in an adult or has had adult age appropriate sexual relationships and they commit a sexual offence against a prepubescent child. That's what I mean by the child sex offender as opposed to the person who has never had a secondary sex characteristic stroke adult sexual relationship and who has sexually abused a prepubescent child. And, and everything else about them tells us that they are paedophile in their interest. So for the child sex offender, the assessment, don't forget we're going to be looking at the family and all of that funneling that I've talked about, but I'm moving you more specifically to look at the sexuality stuff. So in this assessment, I'm looking at body shape. I'm looking at what is the attraction to that body shape? What is it that they like about the child body shape? Is it about the fact that, that it is nice skin, it's soft skin, it hasn't been affected yet by the secondary sex characteristics of puberty? Is it about the physicality of that body? Is it about being able to engage in, in an activity that they want to do with the physicality of that body and, and in some way break that body and do what they want to do to that? Where the deviancy is very much coming in here is the pain, distress and the lack of consent. Like I've said to you, deviancy is how, how far from the norm. When we engage in the norm um, with sexual activity with our partners, um, we tend not to engage in sexual activity when somebody is upset um, or distressed because that, that's, not, that's not good. You, that's, that's a no, you don't, you don't do that. And the reason for that being is because obviously that's not very arousing. So what you're looking for here is how come somebody, firstly, has continued to, and it's about AME, if you can sort of remember that, is how come they can achieve arousal, firstly, to a body form that, they, that isn't sexual, that they can maintain that arousal. And in those cases where penetrative sexual activity takes place, they are able to continue that arousal through penetration to ejaculation, 
if it's a male, and continue to successfully perform. And as you know, that's in, in, in italics. And what I mean by that is, what are the things cognitively, emotionally, visually, physically, that they have been able to overcome in themselves to become aroused and successfully engage in a sexual activity with a child when clearly distress and upset will have been shown. That's somebody who really has gone quite significantly over to the le level of deviancy. That's what we mean by that. So in other words, the sexuality of arousal has now become very much linked to arousal to pain, to distress, to that lack of consent, to being able to successfully pre perform. And therefore, if you also have somebody who's also attracted to the post-puberty body as well, so for example, if somebody has sexually offended against a four-year-old, but we also know they've committed sexual offences against the 14, 15-year-olds, and they're also with an adult person as well, that's telling you basically they have no limits. Those are somebody who all of that age range is going to pose a risk to, because for them, it'll be about the act. It'll be very much about the act that they can perform, and for them, that's about pain and distress. So it's really a bit funneling down and narrowing down that. If we, for example, now take the, an example of the of the rapist, as I said, I can only do a very brief in each one of those. If we take the example of the rapist, again, you're talking about the physicality of that. And if we take rape to be engaging in a sex activity without consent, we're also looking then in terms of what is arising to somebody to be able to engage in a sexual activity with somebody who clearly is showing that they don't want this. What, what's arising about that? Why do they like that? What is the and you're looking at the degree of the deviancy of that? What is it about it? Is it the fact that they can do whatever they like to this person? Is it about they just don't care about that person and that means they can engage in whatever sexual activity they want to engage in, regardless of having any empathy for that individual? So, for example, the best way I can just I suppose to help you with the discussion around rape would be in a mutually consensual, respectful relationship, we do not engage in sex activity unless that person is also, you know, prepared to do it as well and that we are both feeling in the mood for it and we both want to have some sex activity together. Rape is to the further other end extreme of this, which is they do not care whether or not you want to engage in it or not. And actually that's the excitement because I can do to you what I want how hard I want, as long as I want, I can do it as hard to you, I can cause you as much harm as I want. And that's the arousing bit. And that's really what you're looking at in terms of with, with the rapist. But within that, that actually means is that again, from a sexual point of view and from a physicality of that sexuality, is that's what their arousal is. So therefore, for somebody therefore in an assessment saying to me, Marcella, I'm quite happy now with an age appropriate, you know, sexual relationship with my partner. And, you know, we have, um, you know, vaginal sex once a month and I'm content with that and it's okay. They may do, but that's a big jump. So I would be assessing how come you're telling me that that's the case now. You would have to go a lot of understanding of his sexual functioning to say, to get back to that. So what, what are the cognitive messages now? And probably for that person, I'm probably not necessarily believing that they're there yet, given the extent of, of what they needed to be aroused in the first place. But also within the rape, I'm going to be talking a bit about it, the paraphilia. So in most sexual offending, there is the existence of a significant amount of paraphilias. And I'll talk a wee bit about that just later on. The internet offenders, I, the difference with them is what we're looking at, is the amount of time that they spend uh, looking and observing it. Contact, the deviancy, the paraphilia, and the impact on the victim. The issue with the internet offenders is, is that unlike our other in the room, as I'm going to call them, okay, not, not contact or non-contact, but in the room, if I'm a sex offender who commits a sex offence in the room, I'm actually limited by the external. So, for example, I'm limited by somebody could come back, the victim could scream, somebody could hear. I better be careful of the actual physical activity I do with the victim because in case they get damaged and they might need medical assistance, which means they're going to find out about me. So I have a lot of external things that limits me to probably engage in what I want to do, but also I'm time limited. Internet offenders 
are not time limited. So hence they can be on the computer for hours and hours at end. But that also means physi physiologically and sexual arousal, they maintain their sexual arousal for a much longer period of time than the in the room person who needs to go in, do what they want to do and come back out again, if that makes sense. The internet person can stay on that computer and for every image and video that they watch and, and, and video clip, their arousal keeps increasing and increasing. So they have a more sustained, longer length of arousal time, which is very hard to bring back into a normal sexual relationship. And therefore, for them, what you will find is they get bored very quickly with the still image and they need to search more and more and more. So actually, the internet offender presents with the greatest level of deviancy than are in the room ones because of what it is that they're looking at. They need more and more arousal, more and more deviancy, more and more unusual activity, much more and more extreme in order to get the same arousal that they got whenever they, for example, first started to watch it. So it's, that's the, the key thing around funneling for the internet. The person with the learning disability, the issue for them is the fact that they have a lack of internal controls. Like boobs, grab boobs. It's that sort of thing with the person with the learning disability because they don't have the gray bit in between. It's black and white. They don't know if they may like breasts with a female. They don't know how to sort of manage that in a public setting. So they're much more direct in terms of how they engage in their sexual activity. With the person with the learning disability, however, a lot of the funneling and concerns is actually about attitudes of the family and professionals maybe about their carers, um, about that you know, they tend to sexually reoffend much sooner because they have no internal controls. So usually somebody with a learning disability doesn't necessarily have a lot of deviancy as such, but actually they do present with a greater risk of reoffending because they cannot manage it themselves and we need a lot more tighter external controls. So for example, we would use the armadillo as the assessment tool for, for the learning disability in terms of helping us to sort of look at both the environment as well as staff, cares, parents, and understanding how they manage that. So that's that, if always training you on that, that's what we would look at to help us with that. With those in terms of engaged, for example, in child sexual exploitation and gang type sexual offending, the funnel in here is around how did they find like-minded persons to engage in same sex activity? How do they how do they know that? How do how do I go into a house and say to somebody, look, do you fancy coming with me? There's a 12 year old and we're going to do this and sexually explain. How do you do that? How do you find those like minded individuals? But also the degree of deviancy with this is because generally these type tend to be young girls where often and young boys where drugs and alcohol, they can't consent. Where again, if you think about it from a sexuality point of view, to be able to engage in sexual activity with a young person after another person has done it, that takes a lot of sexual functioning to really think about that from a sexual arousal point of view. So somebody has just had sex, penetrative sex activity with this person who potentially could be drugged or have alcohol and are unable to consent and is maybe just you know, sadly lying there and you, your friend has just had penetrative sex activity with them. And yet you're aroused by that enough to perform the same, that it really gives you an insight into the level of deviancy of that individual as and in terms of thinking about it, being able to have sex with the same person after your friend, but also observing that. So you've got the voyeurism in there as well. So that's some of the things we need to funnel for the, for the CSE. With the females, we've got in terms of six different categories of female sex offenders. Again, we could talk for all day on this, but the you know the big thing in terms of the females for funnel and the female females has been a really usefully really useful categorization of the different types because each one of those types will get a different need met in terms of what they're meeting by the sex by, by engaging in the in the sexual offending behaviour. And we're getting more and more, I know certainly throughout the UK and, and my work in Ireland as well, but also in Gibraltar where I do some work, an increasing amount of older females targeting and bringing on younger females in terms of in that gang culture to sort of to 
bring them in as new victims, which then moves them up the line in terms of much more in terms of power and control. So in terms of with the females, we need to look, firstly assess what type of female sex offender we're dealing with, and then we funnel down to go, and what need did that meet within you? So the formulation is bringing all that information together. The formulation of the risk assessment is separating out what type of a sex offender am I dealing with? What are the are the precedents to it? What to understand it? What's the presenting problem? What were those predisposing factors in terms of that early life experiences? Was there any trauma is the reason why they've done it? What were the precipitating factors as to why they've done it? Were there any critical life events as to the reason why they've engaged in sexual activity? But also we're looking at what are the maintaining because generally those people who are engaged in an assessment have been doing this more than more than on one occasion. So for the analysis and formulation, we're using those five P's. We're looking at what are the risks, not just sexual. We're looking at in what circumstances. So again, come back to the different type of offender and on what circumstances are they sexually offending? How immediate is the risk? How volatile is that risk? Is some of them historical? What do we mean by historical? Has it passed? So if somebody did it 10 years ago and has not done anything since, can we actually say they probably won't do it again? What are their sexual needs and what, how are they being met now? That's why they might sexually reoffend. We need to ask about their sexual intimacy now, and that's not helpful if we don't do that. So we need to do that. And what are the therapeutic needs? And what is realistic plan to reduce those? It's not whether they're low, medium and high, but what the, they are a risk. What is that risk and in what circumstances? And we need to name it. So it's not about stating that level of risk in any child protection case conference report without the context to it and circumstances to it. Listen out for denial, because we're very quick as professionals to look out for denial, and we sort of very quickly use the word he's in denial. But there's very few people actually fully deny to me. Denial to me is I wasn't in the country at the time. But sometimes what people will say is they'll say it happened, but it wasn't them. It happened and they wanted it too. That's, that's victim blaming, but that's not denial. And what tends to happen is we use victim blaming as he's denying his responsibility. But that's not denying that I did something. So I suppose what I would do in terms of assessment is encourage you to listen out for what are they able to admit to rather than focusing on what are they denying in terms of responsibility. That's that's not what about denying of responsibility is not about whether or not they'll do it again. What I want to hear about is what's their justification as to why they think they might do it again. So I've given you that denial continuum to take a look at. So what we're looking at, if I move you to in terms of the ability to protect, because the last couple of slides I've covered, is the CASP too. The CASP stands for the capacity to and ability to protect and supervise, to supervise and protect. And that's a tool which will be launched in, in uh, the beginning of 2019 by um, my colleague, Garth McGibbon and, and myself. And what we have done with this tool is that we have been quite, we've been quite concerned is that there's been an assumption that the non-abusing parent has assumed to have been non-abusing and has been therefore assumed to be protective because of the grooming that takes place by the offender of the system in which he is sexually offended in, I actually need to eliminate that the members of that system, either by omitting to protect or committing the abuse, as, as opposed to me making the assumption first that they're all protective. The partner, for example, who, has been, who knows that their partner has been sitting for three to four hours every night on the computer and never asking why. The person who, for example, knows that the child has a change of behaviour and hasn't asked why, hasn't asked why there's been maybe some blood staining, hasn't asked any of that, why would I automatically assume they are protective? So what we have developed is about understanding the impact, the family, the legal, the psychological, the social, financial and professional impact in terms of for a partner if their partner has been caught in terms of you know committing any sort of sexual abuse. But within that, we also know they go through grief and loss, which also means they're not really ready to step up to be protective. The denial can be that they didn't do it. Anger at the, at the child for telling, but also anger at the agencies. Bargaining, he was only viewing images he didn't touch. The depression when they realized the reality. So within this, we know that to make an assumption that the, the, the non-abusing, vertical partner 
is protective is actually a wrong assumption. We need to be very clear that the protective partner needs to accept there is a risk. They need to accept who poses that risk. They need to develop the skill to be a supervisor and a protector. In other words, to be an effective supervisor, it means I have the right to ask you, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why do you not want to come with me? Why are you keeping the child behind? What are you looking at on the computer? And I can only be an effective supervisor if the offending partner accepts me asking those questions. So for example, if there was ever any domestic violence in that relationship, why would I assume that person could be an effective supervisor? They can't. So therefore the CASP tool that I've developed is about looking at the supervisory capacity of the partner to protect as well as their ability to be a protector. Because lots of mummies and daddies and families are good, are, are protective if it was a stranger, but not if it was somebody within their home. Make them, they've got to make the transition through the grief process to let go of who, or, who they thought their partner was and start that journey of accepting what risk they may pose. And they need to walk alongside us and be a pro proactive protector and not somebody who actually chooses their own needs over the needs of the child. So we need to assess protectiveness and their supervisor. So coming to a conclusion, what we need to know in terms of risk assessment is what is the risk? Who do they pose a risk to? Funnel that down and under what circumstances can that be managed? And if it can be managed, who can manage it? And is it manageable then for ourselves from authorities' point of view, from a governance perspective? And with that, I'm going to move into bringing leaving you with a nice image of, of Northern Ireland while we maybe hear some of your questions. Thank you.